Hey, hello everyone. This is criminal profiler, Pat Brown, and this is hangout number 45. So getting to the almost 50 spot after, I can't believe it. it's like almost a year's worth of hangouts. Hmm. Anyway, hi guys. I'm um, glad you're here. We have a lot of people in the chat room. I'm going to be talking a whole bunch of interesting things tonight. Uh, Jody Hoosentrout, uh, there it's an anniversary date for her gone missing from uh, Minnesota. Um, I have another Innocent project, innocence project case. I want to point out some of the issues with, and just a bunch of other very interesting things. Oh, and um, I was asked to also do the the case of. Hold on a second. Let me pull it up here. I uh, get her name correctly. Um, that would be uh, where is she? Oh, this is the uh, teen that went missing out of Saskatchewan in 2016. Her name is Michaela Bali. Um, so, oh, and Benny says. Per picture, perfect picture and sound pack. I'm glad, Benny, and I'm glad you're awake because I do know it is really late for you in Denmark. So I'm amazed that you're even here. That's awesome. So let me see who else is here. We've got Carrie. We've got Heidi, Lisa S., Carolina. Um, we've got Molly. And let's see. Let me go up a little further here. Hold on a second. I'm going to push my little thing here. Uh, and Christine is here. And Carrie's here. If I missed anybody so far, I, I sometimes have trouble. Anna's here, um, and there we go. There, I think I think I've got everybody, but I may not have. So, and I'm sure more will join in. If you want to join in the chat room up at the Hangouts and in my live shows and the phone ends, please do go below, click on Patreon, join Patreon. It helps support the channel. And for five bucks a month, you get to join in eight different shows and. Uh, I don't keep them. I don't have the chat rooms open to the public. So this is this is a chat room where all my people are a great community. Uh, but also, you just you can see every one of my videos. They're always available to the public. So please do like and subscribe and support the channel so I can put out more content and check the playlist. I always say it's so important because I always get these requests. I wish you'd do this case, and I'm like, check the playlist. It's already there for you. Um, and also hit the bell so you get notifications. All right. So that's it on that let me get to the topics of today let me see if anybody else came in here let me figure things out Heidi says I am unfamiliar with the content subjects tonight looking forward to everyone's thoughts well they'll they'll be new to you some of them are new to me and that's what's so nice when uh, my my patrons and my subscribers say hey can you talk about this and I look at it and I'm like I didn't know about that one. Oh, let me just let you know what I'm going to do on Sunday. I'm doing the Judith Smith case, Judy Smith. She's the woman uh, that went missing. She went uh, to meet her husband in Philadelphia. She's in her 50s, went to meet her husband. He was doing a, some kind of work thing. Uh, and she went to meet him in Philadelphia. And then she vanished. And her body ended up in the mountains of North Carolina. And it's one of the strangest cases. And I've had people actually, uh, they've asked me, what's, your, what's the most difficult case you've ever come in co contact with? And I'm going to say, this might be the one. Now, I don't, didn't work on this personally, but as I've been investigating it, if I could go down one of those rabbit holes, <laughs> this could be it. Um, because it is really a strange case. But there is still evidence. And this is what's going to make, I think, a really great show. Because for all the bizarre ideas with the case, we could go this way, we could go that way. How could this even happen? Because it's so crazy. There is a thing called evidence. And certain pieces of evidence tell us something. And that's what I'm going to really bring to light. So I think that's important. And on that note, before I go into uh, Jody Hoosentrout, and I hope I am saying her name correctly, Hoosentrout, um, I'm I, I, having been in the uh, television industry but I'm most impressed that Jody Hoosentrout kept her last name because a lot of people would just change that for the ease of being on television. I actually had a very difficult last name, my maiden name, um, that nobody could say properly. And uh, I got married and became a Brown. And when I got divorced, I'm like, I'm keeping that name because <laughs> it's a lot easier to say Pat Brown. And blah, 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 blah. So, all right. So let me. I want to point out this thing about evidence um, first, and then you'll see on Sunday how this really pertains, um, and tonight how it really pertains. So anyway, I had done the, and I'll put the link below, 
uh, the Panama puzzle. This is the case of the two girls. Their names were Chris. I can, I'm not sure I got her name right. Chris Kremers and Lisanne Froon. I'm sure I butchered that. It's been a long time since I've heard their names. So they went, they went down to Panama. There were two young, two, two young ladies and they loved hiking and they went up this volcano and then they kept going and then they went missing. And, and so they were eventually their bones were found. Let's put it that way. Now I, I analyzed this case and I said, everything points to this is an accidental, these are accidental deaths. The girls got lost. It was a domino effect of a bad choice led to other difficult choices and nothing ever worked out and had an unfortunate ending. And a lot of people get really upset about that because they're very invested in this case and they believe these girls were murdered by uh, tour guides, the locals and, you know, and kind of the people of Panama aren't always so thrilled that Panama is being you know, trashed in such a way that, you know, don't come down here because Panamanians kill people. So anyway, uh, uh, one of the, one of my um, subscribers had written me and I thought this was a, very, this is very honest in how people think. She said, I have been very, I have been emotionally involved with this case since 2014. Now this person has a good reason to be emotionally involved, not just your internet usuals, <laughs> you know, like, you know, I've been watching you know, on the internet for like, you know, 500 watch hours on a case and I'm like obsessed with it, but I don't have any clue who that person actually is. She actually knows. I, I go to the same church as the parents. And her brother was also uh, somebody uh, that the family knew. So almost everybody in this area, um, because I'm a shoot, uh, and the family believe it was foul play. The family, you know, uh, are very upset about the book called Lost in the Jungle, didn't want to be publicized, and, and it was released anyway. She says, um, I am almost certain it was foul play, but I'm also keeping every possibility open. Good for her. Uh, that's that's a very good way to think because that's the smartest thing to do she says uh we simply cannot know what actually happened true we cannot know exactly what happened because there are too many uncertainty uncertainties surrounding the mystery of what happened to them yes and no yeah oh, there's always uncertainties when you cannot you know absolutely be sure of what happened every minute and we cannot spend our lives saying when all the evidence points this way, we're still going to say it could happen some other way. That's the same thing is true in a court of law. That's why it's um, reasonable doubt and not ridiculously minimal doubt. <laughs> like, you know, who knows? There's 99 pieces of evidence that this person's guilty, but you know, you just never know. That's that. You can't live life like that. You have to make determinations. So anyway, this is what she said. And I wrote back. The problem with being emotionally involved is lack of objectivity. I have found that when a family loses a child to suicide or accident, they will also go to great often, sorry, they will often go to great lengths to prove they were murdered. Somehow it is easier for a family to accept that their loved one was not in any way responsible for what happened. That it is someone else's fault. There is nothing in this case that points to anyone else being involved with these girls' deaths. Everything points to an unfortunate choice that led to a more unfortunate event and then ended up in a sad fate. And she wrote back to me. Um, hold on a second. Let me find the. All right. She wrote back. Uh, then there are Peter R. DeVries, Hendrik. Um, these are all Dutch names. Can't pronounce them. John Korterink and John, John Van Den Heuvel. These are Netherlands biggest official crime investigators for the last 40 years. You might have heard of them. I think I heard of one of them. Um, they have literally solved hundreds of cases like the famous Natalie Holloway case. Okay. They are all convinced it was foul play and they're not emotionally involved. So they've got nothing personal gain on this. Okay. That's not entirely true. Sometimes when there is a, an outcry by the family and public to think a certain way, there are investigators and profilers who will, because they're not the detectives on the case, will then push their concepts that way and say, this is what we think could have happened too, because it's more popular. And when you do the opposite, people don't like you, <laughs> you know, so you go for the popular. I've seen it happen. So I wrote back again, I stand by my analysis and she wrote back. Yes. And that's fine. Um, I keep all possibilities open until there's actual proof. 
Now, I just want to point out something because I do block people. And they say, well, you just because I didn't agree with you, you blocked me. No, I, I blocked you because you insulted me and were rude. <laughs> and this particular person has a, a different opinion, but she, she was very polite. And I thought very reasonable in her expressing of, of that. So I'm okay with that. But I want to point out the end line here. I keep all possibilities open. Good. Until there is actual proof. Actual proof of what? And this is a good point. Actual proof of what? The actual proof, which I based my analysis on, was the location they were in that showed no other person with them, the fact that they kept trying to get emergency help over days, which meant that they were in trouble. But if they had been kidnapped, they wouldn't be having those phones in their hands. Uh, when they, they, there was a number of days that went by, I think it was almost 10. I haven't seen this case in a while. And there were the final pictures, which were taken on before they apparently died of weird pictures in the, in the dark, uh, some rocks and things, uh, freaky stuff. People go, oh, it's so creepy. But in other words, somebody was either trying to light the area or was just clicking on pictures in, in the last moments of delirium. Again, no other person involved. And then later on, their backpack, the backpack was found. And the backpack was found with phones, money, and a camera. Um, and the thing is, if the phones, the money, and the camera were in the backpack, nobody had them. In other words, if somebody had abducted them, they would have, they, first of all, they wouldn't have access to the phones all that time, and they would have done something to them, and they would have either stolen their stuff or crushed their stuff or did something to it. And likewise, even if they were attacked on the trail someplace, if somebody had their bag, they'd take that money in a heartbeat because that money was worth a lot of money for people in the lo location they were in in Panama. So actually there was evidence. The evidence pointed toward an accidental death by getting lost. There was zero evidence pointing to anybody else involved. So there was evidence, but you see this last statement. I'll keep all possibilities until there's actual proof. There was proof, the camera, the money, the backpack, the phone calls, there was lots of proof. You just don't like what the proof points to. Now you want some different proof. <laughs> the different proof is what? Somebody comes forward and says, I killed the girls. I mean, that would be the, the proof you're looking for is that it was murder. And this is the problem I run into quite often that when somebody really wants it to be murder, they will ignore all the evidence that says it is not. So it isn't that there isn't evidence, it's that you don't like the evidence because it doesn't give you the conclusions you would like. And I think that's just a very important point to make. So anyway, I thought that was really interesting. So now let me go to, oh my goodness, what does Bernie say here? Oh, I have to read this. I just went through the Michaela Bali case with my daughter as she is on the same medicine as Michaela, and she is also a teenager. It, it is having a lot of online communication. So I use it as a, used it as a scare. Good for you. Um, yeah. So oh, I'm going to go ahead with Michaela and then I'll go to uh, Jody. Michaela's going to be pretty short. Okay. And the reason I do uh, some of these cases during the hangouts is because I don't have two hours worth of material. I, I can do something for, you know, 10 minutes and I guess I could make a show out of it. Um, but that's just not the way I work. <laughs> so anyway, let me get, let me do Michaela first here. Um, okay, let me find her here. Okay, where is it? Oh, there we go. Okay. Wait a minute. Hold on a second. Don't you disappear on me? You know, I always have this problem with things disappearing. It drives me crazy. Um, so uh, anyway, Michaela Bali, she's a uh, can Canadian citizen who at the age of 16 disappeared from her hometown, Yorkton in Saskatchewan, Canada. And I just want to say I have been to Saskatchewan. So I, I just so you know when you've been in an area, you have a little bit of a, oh, you know. Anyway, uh, she was seen last seen between 1 and 1.45 p.m. at a local bus stop, despite several reported sightings. Mm, the sighting problem is always questionable, Okay. Uh, they don't know where she is and has never been found since 2016. So we're talking six years have gone by. Now, uh, she was living with her mother. Her father was not officially known, but after her disappearance, her father appeared out of sort of somewhere <laughs> um, and uh, had some uh, 
Yeah. Okay. Somebody said it was, yeah, she, he was the dad, but anyway, that, that really probably ha wasn't too much to do with what happened to her. Although some might say he maybe he wanted to meet her or something, but anyway, here's an interesting point right here. Personality. Her mother described Bali as a shy and quiet girl. She enjoyed playing the violin and participated in the drama club at her high school where she was attending 11th grade at the time of her disappearance. Likewise, one of her high school friends described her as caring and very conscientious about her, her friend's needs. Bali had no his, history of disappearing for extended periods of time. Only for short periods of time? Hmm. Okay. And according to her mother, she was not a risky kid. Although she was bullied at times for her acne. She did have really bad acne. Um, her mother felt around the time of the disappearance, she was hitting her stride. And I want to point out right here, this is where some of the problems come in. And this is what the police deal with. From what you're reading here, what you have is a, a violin playing, very quiet student who everybody says is very sweet and has no problems. That is not true. That's what her mother said. And this can distort an investigation because parents don't want to say their child would do this or do that, but their child is actually doing this or that. So, and it, it can interfere with trying to find out what happened to somebody when the parents don't aren't truthful or she just doesn't know. You know, some parents are blinded uh, to their children's behavior, uh, sometimes because they don't want to see it, sometimes because their kids are really sneaky. You know, depends which one it is. And a lot of times the friends don't want to rat their friend out either, so you don't hear it from them. Um, so I'll, I'll get later onto some of the issues with her. Um, so anyway, she did have really bad uh, acne problems, which could be an issue when people talk about sex trafficking. It's you know, a child who has got severe acne is probably less profitable to somebody than one who doesn't. She's not an unattractive girl. Let me put a picture up. Um, uh, just that she's just struggled with this, with acne. And uh, I was one of the fortunate children who never, when I grew up, never had acne. So, you know, um, that sucks for her, but I really, I don't, I don't, I didn't have it. So here she is. Uh, and she she's she's not she's an she is an attractive girl um and but she did have acne problems um here's a couple there's this is another picture of her um and I think that was someplace where she was seen anyway um okay so what happened they report into up to her the days of her disappearance she mentioned several places she would soon visit okay. They also said she had claimed to have $5,000, Canadian 5000 in her bank account, although police later confirmed that was not the case. On the day before she disappeared, she sent a text message to a friend asking for a ride to a bank. She also communicated with the bank several times and eventually wired $25 to her account. In the evening, she sent messages to several other friends stating she wasn't happy about something and needed help. You know, you so you see, she's in emotional distress right here. This is not a happy violin playing kid who nothing's going wrong. She's in trouble. She is in ter terribly much in trouble. Then she, on the morning that she disappeared, she also sent another message asking for another ride. And then um, the grandmother drove her to school. And, but the CCTV footage, thank God CCTV is around, um, showed her putting her binder inside her locker at 8.21 a.m. and then leaving the school through the back entrance. And she was next seen walking along a railroad track. That was surveillance camera also. Uh, then she went to a pawn shop and tried to pawn a silver ring and didn't get any money out of it. So that didn't work. Then she went to the bank, got 55 bucks. Then at 9, 10, they showed her going into a restaurant, a Tim Hortons, buys a drink, sits down at the table using her phone. And then, then she leaves the restaurant uh, 50 minutes later, she's out of the restaurant. Then she comes back in, goes out another exit. Okay. Uh, forming a wild circle, checking the area around the restaurant in a counterclockwise direction. She enters the restaurant again. She sits down. She's using her phone again. At 10, 12, she sends a text to a friend saying, hey, I need help. And then she says, I figured it out. And she re leaves again. And then she re enters again. She walks over to an elderly lady, and starts a com elderly lady and starts a conversation. And she had asked the lady for help in renting a hotel room. So the lady said, no. And then she uses her telephone again, leaves the restaurant this time for good. She's seen walking down the street. And then she, let's see, 
then where is she? Then she's seen at the bus bus depot, um, and she inquired when the next bus. Uh, I think it's Regina, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, but who knows if I am. Um, when she learned the bus would leave at 5 p.m., she left the bus station without purchasing a ticket. This was about 10 to 12 p.m. till 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Now. But it's actually a surveillance video again between 11 and 11.45. Then she sent another message to a friend saying, I'll see you at lunch. She goes back to the high school, but meets only with two students in the school cafeteria. She said she was going to take a bus for vacation. Then she left again, and she was staying at a trail stop restaurant where she ordered lunch. That was attached to the bus depot. And then she doesn't appear to get on any of the buses. And that was in. Then nobody saw her again. Her phone was turned off at 6 40, uh, 51 a.m. the next morning. She never used her social accounts since. So she gone and nobody's ever found her. Nobody knows who if she went off with somebody. Nobody knows if she met anybody. Uh, there was only one fellow. Uh, he had some stocky guy, but it turned out he wasn't anything. Um, somebody who had just she talked to for a second in the restaurant. Um, they got tons of tips and all that kind of stuff. And there's a bunch of theories about what could have happened to her. Um, and there was one thing I really wanted to find. Okay. Let's see. She hadn't taken her acne medication, which she thought was weird. Um, that was the mother. Now, I'm trying to find the one thing that I wanted to. Okay. Hold on one second. There was another article, and the reason I kept that article was because of a statement made in the article. All right. Whether she was lured or something like that. All right. Now, so they, again, they, they talk about how she's a, um, a good kid. We didn't like to go out and party much, but we'd rather stay home and have a quiet night by herself. She loved playing the violin and was a fan of the Hunger Games and popular video game League of Legends. However, um, let's see, where is it? Where is the thing I found that I thought was interesting? Okay, hold on a second. Hold on one second. Where did it go? No, don't disappear on me. Um, okay, we're Aha, uh -huh. there we go. Here we go. Okay. There's also been speculation that there's some other issues going on. According to these people, Michaela wasn't exactly who she was portrayed in the media that she was a lot more depressed than she was portrayed. She skipped school a lot and she did drugs. Others claimed her mother was a religious zealot and wouldn't let her dad be involved in her life because he refused to go to church. There's been speculation that Michaela ran away to get away from her mother and her less than ideal uh, home life. Now, that's all I wanna point out. The problem we have with a lot of these cases when, when children especially te mostly teenagers leave under circumstances like this. There's something seriously going wrong at home. Normally teens just don't run away from home. They don't uh, because it's, they know it's scary out there. Um, they've got friends at school for them to want to leave home, to abandon their home and what connection they have to family and to all their friends and to disappear somewhere out there in the world at the age of 16. You got problems. That kid had problems, severe emotional problems. Whether she was doing drugs, I do not know. This is this is information that is not necessarily so. Uh, but she looked like she was trying to meet somebody. And did she meet them or didn't she meet them? She didn't have a lot of money to go very far with. So th the problem is sometimes in seeking help to get away from whatever they're in. Yes, girls will go online and meet somebody or they'll meet somebody someplace else and they'll say, hey, you know, help me out here, give me a ride, or whatever they do. Uh, and they become easy victims. And they become easy victims for serial killers. They become easy victims for prostitution. And people will say sex trafficking. So that's a 
mostly a legal term, but people use it a little too loosely these days, that what will happen is when you are a young person, you have no means of support. Somebody will take you in, sometimes a guy, and then he will say, hey, you know, you got to make some money. Here's how you do it. And he'll introduce that that teenager into prostitution, especially if she's a drug has drug issues, then he's going to give her drugs and then she's going to be trapped in drugs and prostitution. But she hasn't been seen in six years. So where is she? Either she's changed her looks a lot and changed her name and somehow living in, you know, kind of a, a hidden life, but she is going older by the day. Uh, she would now be what, 60 account. <laughs> um, she would be 22. It's hard to say. It's hard to say that she didn't meet some disastrous end with a John, with a, with a, with a pimp, uh, with just some guy she went off with because she had no place to stay. And it turns out to be some creep, who, uh, some serial killer dude or something else. We just don't know. Um, and so there's not, it's, it's hard to say they've looked for her and they can't find her. All they can do is keep her face out there and her name out there and hope that one day some information pops up. But they obviously she vanished at a certain point and they just couldn't track her. And once that's done, um, you know, it's, a, it's a big country, you know what I mean? You can go anywhere in it. Um, and especially if you're in a, around a bunch of people who aren't the most honorable, shall we say, they're not talking to police, you know, if she's doing drugs with people or, doing, or involved in prostitution, they're not like saying, oh yeah, we got her. <laughs> so you just don't know. Um, so very, very sad. Um, but you know, this is why I, I go on over and over again, that one of the biggest problems we have today with the, the, the misunderstanding of what sex trafficking is because there, there's these organizations everywhere in the internet pushing that we have massive child sex trafficking in this country. And people view that as kids being kidnapped right and left, I don't know, on the way to buy, eat ice cream. No, this girl is the type of girl who will end up in, a, in becoming into prostitution. And they call it sex trafficking for the purposes of uh, labeling it for, you know, so you legally, you can do more, more stuff uh, with the, the police can do more things. Justice system can do more things. It's called sex trafficking when essentially somebody's in the, uh, under the care <laughs> of another person who is then using them to, in, in, the, in the prostitution business. Um, and it, it, we used to call it just prostitution, but now we have a fancier term. Uh, but this is really the way it goes down. So this is why I keep pointing out to people, the real problem isn't strangers kidnapping your kid. The real problem is in your home. If your home is a mess, if your, emotion, your kid has emotional problems, if you haven't seen what your kid is getting into, if your child is getting into drugs, that's where the problem starts because that child goes out of control and then to meet her needs, whatever they are, emotional or drug use or whatever, then she becomes susceptible to, to being pushed into prostitution and then not getting back out of it again. And that's very dangerous. So I just like people to understand that's the real danger starts in the home, not out there. Because if your child is generally a healthy child, your child just doesn't go missing except for a serial killer. That's the real danger is a serial killer. If your child's walking home from school and just vanishes, serial killer. But if your ch child's being lured into drugs, um, alert, I mean, not lured, lured into prostitution via drugs or uh, homelessness because they've run away, uh, whatever, because things aren't good at home. That's the important part. So um, I just want to point that out because that's really what where, really where it matters. Um, let's see. What did uh, Benny says? She did not take her phone charger and she took a backpack instead of a purse as she always did to school. Interesting. Yeah. There was, there was no question. She was planning to leave, you know, um, she was going somewhere. The question is where did she think she was actually going? I'm sure she wasn't going on vacation. Um, who was she going with? Because she didn't seem to have the money to get where she thought she wanted to go. So I'm not sure how all that played out, but, um, it's, uh, you know, it's a sad situation that, you know, it, obviously something was wrong already. She wasn't just a happy violin student who liked to stay at home and you know, eat ice cream. That's just not true. Um, but somewhere she became desperate enough to want to leave home. And 
she could have her own, you know, her reasoning is, you know, teenagers can be a little, you know, crazy with her reasoning too, but, you know, that's something that hopefully if you have a stable home life, the child isn't going to run away. You know, she's going to hang out until she can get, become 18 and go do whatever she wants to do or go off to college or whatever. Um, but she's not going to run away with no money um, and leave all her friends and family behind unless something's wrong. So I just want to point that out. Uh, and that's really, I, you know, I can't, I can't say what happened to her. I just know it's not good. <laughs> you know, not good, not good. But now let's go to Jody Hoosen Trout and what happened to her. Um, uh, Jody Hoosen Trout. Now it's been 27 years. Let me just show you uh, a picture of Jody. Um, Here's my picture. Okay. Uh, this is, I think, just the prettiest picture of her. She she was a lovely, lovely young woman. Um, uh, she disappeared in, uh, she was declared legally and dead in 2001, but that's not when she disappeared. Uh, she was born in Long Prairie, Minnesota. She grew up um, and she went to St. Cloud State University. And then in 1995, she was working for a uh, CBS TV affiliate. KIMTV, KIMT TV in Mason County, Mason City, Iowa. So she wasn't actually in Minnesota at the time. She went missing. She was in Iowa. All right. Now, she. This was uh, is this her house. Nope. Sorry, that's not the picture I want to show you. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Where's her house? Okay. So anyway, she's living in an apartment. Um. Oh, here we go. It's the key apartment. So she's living in key apartments. Um, and there's a, there's a, there's an entrance, you know, each, each uh, apartment doesn't have a separate entrance. So she would come out of her apartment into the hallway and then come out into the parking lot. This is what happened. Uh, she disappeared at 4 AM on June 27th, 1995. And her, she was late to work. Uh, so one of her, her workmates called up and said, where are you, Jody? You know, because you're supposed to be at work. Um, and once in a while she'd screw up because it's a really more early morning show, you know, where you have to be on air so early. Anyway, she, um, but she, then they, she didn't show up after the, she said she was on her way. She didn't show up. Uh, officers immediately deemed it was an abduction after finding her car in the parking lot and a pair of women's shoes, a, bl a blow dryer, a bottle of hairspray, car keys, and earrings scattered around the car, not in the car, around the car. Um, and I, I can exactly see what she was doing. She jumped into some clothes. She grabbed the thing and she didn't even get them into a bag. She was just grabbing. I got to get my, got to get my hair dryer. I got to get this whatever. Um, and then I, I'm going to run to the car, open the key door and throw my crap in there because I'm going to need it. Maybe I even do it on the way to work. I used to do that. I could do makeup in the car. I used to do a lot of TV. So if, if I was going to some place where I wasn't going to get makeup, I, I could pretty much do makeup before I hit the door of the TV place preferred their own makeup people. But anyway, um, sometimes they're cheap in these places and they don't give them makeup. But anyway, what she, she basically had her hair blow dryer and her hairspray. So she's just going to try to get her earrings on and get her hair done when she gets there. Um, a person re later reported hearing a scream in the parking lot between 4 and 5 a.m. And the key to her car was slightly bent. Um, so it seemed like she had the stuff in her arms. She was opening the car door and somebody grabbed her and abducted her at that point. Um, a witness reported seeing a suspicious white van in the area at the time, but they've never recovered such a vehicle. White vans are problematic because white vans are work vans. And while they are used sometimes for abduction, there's just sometimes so many white work vans around that there's always one at every crime scene. <laughs> you can't believe how many crimes I've looked at. I'm like, the white van. I'm like, oh, I'm not the white van again. And uh, so it isn't necessarily so. So anyway, um, uh, the key to Houston Truth's vehicle was found bent inside the lock of the driver's side door. So she, did, she, it, you know, so somebody grabbed her, and and she was trying to pull her, and she was, you know, so, um, and there was a uh, drag marks uh, visible on the rain-soaked pavement. So they hauled her away, um, and just because I, I have a soft spot in my heart for Jody because she too had a Mazda Miata that she adored and I adore mine as well. So there's mine. Um, just, just, just a funny aside, you know, I have this little repair I need to do to the roof because you know, I've got the, you know, the rag top thing and I've got a rip in it and I need to replace it and I'm cheap and I never do get it done. And so um, 
I had this dream that just two days ago that I came out of the uh, store and my car was like missing from the parking lot. And, and sometimes it's hidden behind vehicles because it's so small you can't find it, you know, because if anything's in front of it, you come out and oh my God, my car is gone. But this time it was really gone in my dream. And I went and told the people that my car had been stolen out of the parking lot. And they came out and gave me $11,000 in cash <laughs> to go buy a new car. And then they, another guy ran out and gave me a $10,000 check. And I'm like, if only this happened in real life, you know. <laughs> $21,000. I was thinking, man, I can just buy myself a new car. And I don't have to fix it. Yeah, that was a dream. Believe me, that was a dream. But anyway, Jody had that basically, she had the same car, which she adored. And um, unfortunately, that morning, she didn't get to get into it. So then what happened is, okay, so she's missing. Um, and she's never found her body is never located. So the question comes down to who done it? Okay. And the reason I'm not doing a whole show on this is because outside of the evidence that was in the, in the parking lot, which was the things that were dropped, I think there's a shoe out there. They got nothing. They, there's supposed to be some handprint on the car, but apparently I don't know what that, whether it was a, was a handprint that wasn't useful or just didn't match anybody. Um, there was no DNA. They got nothing. So, and this happens quite often when you're talking about a, a blitz type of abduction where there's not a lot going on um, except for the person grabs that person and pulls them into another vehicle and leaves with them. Um, so the question is who would do this? Now she was stalked. Um, she said she had complained about being stalked and she was a pretty young thing, very attractive. Um, and very popular on the, on, on the morning news and very, she was extremely bubbly and like the girl next door, but super pretty, but really just always happy. The type of girl, some loser would obsess about. So there were three possibilities in this crime. And I'll tell you what the three are a stalker. Uh, the second one would be just a plain out serial killer. And the third one was the slightly questionable, friend of hers. Um, and let me tell you about the friend of hers, because a lot of people think it's the friend of hers uh, that, that did this to her. Okay. Let me just see some of your comments before I go on on the three possibilities. Um, sour crimes here too. Yay. Okay. <laughs> Molly says, what a great dream. Wasn't it though? You know, you wake up and reality's there and you're like, crap, the car still has a rip, rip in the, uh, and, and you know, the, no, no insurance is going to pay for that and nobody else's either. So that sucks. But uh, <laughs> so anyway, now the friend came under suspicion quite quickly for a good reason. Let me tell you who he was. His name was John Van Sys, a neighbor and friend of Hoosentruth's. Immediately came forward. Let me give you a, a little photo of this dude. Um, where are you, dude? Where are you? Okay. Um, here, he is, here he is with her. Okay. That's the guy in the background. And they're having a party there, as you can see. Now, he came forward and said he was the last person to see the news anchor alive. I always liked that statement. No, actually, if you weren't the one who kidnapped her, you weren't the last person who saw her alive. Are you? Or are you? His claim is that he saw her the night before. But how? Would, why would you say you're the last person who saw her alive? Mm, you could say you're the last person who saw her prior uh, the night before prior to her abduction but hey i also don't know whether this is just the way the media miss miss prints stuff it's always hard to tell anyway according to police uh van Sice, who is much older than hoosentrude told detectives she had visited his apartment the night before and that the two had watched a video he filmed of her birthday party just weeks earlier and then he said oh we had so much fun we laughed and talked about what we'd edit out he he was a little too happy. And that, that bothered a lot of people. They're like, you know, you should be so, you should be totally destroyed, but you look like you're like, hey, she's coming home, you know? So his demeanor was odd. I'll, I'll grant you that. And here's the other thing that bothered me was he claimed that he thought of her as his daughter. Okay, let's take a look at that picture again. I don't know, but I met a lot of guys his age that looked like him who never considered me their daughter. I can tell you that when I was that age. They consider me a nice young woman they wanted to have sex with. That they wanted to have the, for their girlfriend. And they would say, oh, you know, our age difference doesn't matter. I've never seen a dude who's like 20 years old ago. I just think of you as my daughter. 
<laughs> Especially a single guy. A single guy with no kids, uh, you know, he was supposedly a little on the weird side, but he was super friendly and took him out on a boat and all this kind of stuff, his boat, which is a good point, by the way. So anyway, let me point out a couple more things. Uh, he, he lived, this was his house, and he didn't live very far away, so like a, like a five, ten minute drive, very, very close. And he also once lived in that apartment, so he knew the area. And this person clearly knew the area, and they were there awfully early in the morning. So it wasn't like a trucker rolling through. This is somebody who was familiar with that area. Um, whether they knew she was going to walk out is possible because she always did. She was on the news in the early morning. So, you know, if you, if you knew she was on the news and knew where she lived, it wasn't like rocket science to figure she might come out of her apartment early in the morning. Um, or you could just be one of these people who's up early in the morning and you're in the parking lot and you've seen her and you're like, oh, good, somebody I can grab. Or you're this guy who lives, who's lived there and lives close by who says, this is what people think that they were getting together um, looking at these pictures and, and he's finally said, you know, I don't really think of you as my daughter, <laughs> kind of like think of you between my bed sheets. And she's like, Ooh, no, I always thought of you as just, you know, my friend, you know, that doesn't go over well sometimes, especially if a guy has a, uh, it's like personality disorder and ego issues. So, some of the theory some people come up with is that he was really upset about that. And so the next morning he decided, well, like a stalker would, because he kind of had that stalking mentality in the sense that he was in always involving himself in her life and, you know, there all the time and even named his boat after her, which is creepy. Um, she thought it was, Oh, that's so sweet. I think she was very naive. So, that she would come out, that he would finally say, you know, clearly you don't want me and you're going to go off with some other guy and I can't have that. That's a very stalker mentality. So if, if I can't have you, nobody can have you. So I'm going to take you and have you. For, and I'm, forever I'm going to be the last guy you laid eyes on. And let me point out the boat issue. So um, Minnesota, which is, uh, this is Iowa now, but you know, 10,000 lakes in Minnesota. I don't know how many they got in Iowa, but, um, he's got a boat and he has a way to get rid of a body. So I'm sure the police thought about that fact that he could do so. Um, now eventually there was, I think a grand jury and, and a woman that testified absolutely couldn't have done it because she was with him early in the morning that she always called at six in the morning. And then he would wake up and they would go for a walk. And she called him that morning. He was there. They went for a walk. And so she says, no way he could have done it. And she testified to that. Do I believe her? I don't know. She could be telling the truth. I have no clue. Um, was there enough time for him to do something else? I also don't know. Um, apparently, over all this time, he's always been kind of a person of interest, but never arrested. Um, so... I think he plastered a polygraph too. And, but I have no idea. You know, the problem is if they, if I don't, I don't know how well they analyze his, his house, his, uh, his car, his boat and his, and his movements. I don't see, can't seem to find that because that that's in the police reports and apparently not public. If they did all of that due diligence and came up with zero, maybe the guy's just weird, you know, cause you know, there's a lot of weird guys who don't kill people. <laughs> They're just weird. Then there's the one weird one who does kill people. The problem is you can't tell them apart sometimes. So could do you in. Um, and if it's not him, then the question is, who is it? And the problem is they don't know. There has been a number of suspects, a serial rapist uh, who claimed he killed her and, and they couldn't find any proof that that was true. Uh, there's, there's obviously other creepy dudes in the area, serial type of people, serial rapist types, uh, serial killer types. And then, of course, the weirdo stalker who might have grabbed her, but they have no real evidence linking to anybody and they've never found her body. So not having found her body, they can't tell a whole lot of other things. So is this case ever going to be solved? Unlikely. It's just one of those cases that goes down the drain uh, because, uh, you know, you just don't have the links. Um, <laughs> this is true. Naming a boat isn't usually a casual decision for people. Yes, and I do know that they like to name it after uh, females a lot of times. Uh, but, yeah, you know, it's just creepy, uh, you know, because she's not his girlfriend or his daughter. 
And so when somebody does that, if there's some dude who I just knew named his dog, named his boat after me, I'd be creeped. She apparently wasn't. And she took it really well. Like, Oh, that's so sweet. You know, but she was in the limelight. And, um, sometimes you're in the limelight, you, you see people's interest in you, uh, differently than if you're not in the limelight, because if you're never in the not limelight and somebody suddenly showers attention, you're like, it's, that's really like, something's weird about that. But if you're in the limelight and people are always going, oh my God, I just love you, Jody. I just love you. It's just one more person who's crazy about you, you know, because you are cute and perky and, and well-known, you know, and people do get entranced by people who, you know, have that going for them. And, um, but it, it would make him a good suspect. That's all I can say. Uh, oftentimes I say that it's like, if you were the detectives on the case, you would have to look at him as a very good person of interest because he had too much interest in her. That's how he becomes your person of interest. And then you have to nail down other stuff, you know, where he was, does he have an alib real alibi? Does he, do, is there any evidence in, in any of his possessions like the boat? Um, did he have the time frame? Did he, when you brought him in to interview him, did he creep you out? You know, and did he say things that made you go, Ooh, red flag, red flag, or is he just some freaking weirdo and nothing ever came of it. And, and it wasn't him and it was just somebody else happened to be there. And so it's hard to say. So, uh, <laughs> um, and I honestly do not know. Um, uh, this was back in 19, when was this? When was this? This is a long time ago. Did they have, did they have cell phones? <laughs> um, I can't remember when, somebody tell me when cell phones really came in. This is 1995, she disappeared. Um, and so I don't, I don't, I can't remember when I got my first cell phone. Wait a minute, 19, oh, wait a minute, 1995. I know that for a long time I had a pager. When did I get the cell phone? Somebody tell me. When did, I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna. I'm gonna Google. <laughs> when did cell? When when did cell phones become popular? I'll put that in because I my my uh, my brother-in-law Simon Brown, he's a, a famous boxer. Um, he had one of the early cell phones. You know, the one that comes in a big box, and he you know he had won some big fight. And so I remember we went to a picnic. And we're sitting at the picnic table. He took this massive box out and there was a phone in it. And we we're like, oh, it's so impressive, you know. <laughs> so, um, oh, Heidi says, I got my first cell in 1999. Hmm, when did, so? yeah, how phones come out? Okay, let's see what this is. Well, well that's interesting. Wait a minute. Okay, wait a minute. Cell phone. The first portable one was 1973, right? I don't know how portable that sucker was. Um, <laughs> okay. When do we find the clunky? Yeah, the clunky. Whoa. It was, this one was priced at 3,995, which was worth 10,000 a day, which one my, my brother-in-law had, uh, the, because he had just won some major professional fight. Um, so he had become quite wealthy. Um, okay, here we go. When did cell phones become popular? Cell phones became popular during the cellular revolution that started in the nineties interesting in 1990 the number of mobile users was around 11 million really okay wait a minute I'm, okay here's the big one 1985 is a monster then there's another big monster 1987 and another fairly large one the first flip phone 1989 interesting huh 1992 when did they start in first smartphone well that's an ugly thing um 1996 was when it became really popular i think that was the Mo Motorola StarTac. Um, huh, and then the QWERTY keyboard, 1997. So I think most people, um, I'm going to say is in the 1995 and onward. Um, but I, I don't know. Um, yeah, she just was in 1995. It doesn't say she dropped her phone anyplace here. So um, I don't see anything about GPS here at all or anybody's phone. I don't see that. Um, so uh, now, mind you, oh, Francie's here. Uh, hi, Francie. You got yours in 1997. All right, all right. I, I just I can't remember when I got mine. I just that was annoying not to remember that. Okay, so Lisa says uh, so her belongings 
were found scattered near a car. Isn't that risky? Why attack at her apartment more isolated? Because the apartment's inside. And then, you you know, because they're looking for her to come out. That's that's all. Um, you know, once a person's inside, you have a choice. You, you try to, if you want to abduct them, you got to get them out of the apartment, which is, that's not so easy. Um, if you want to kill them in their apartment, of course. But um, parking lot abductions are not un unlikely, especially at that time of morning. There's nobody out there. And also, don't don't misunderstand. Just because somebody was abducted that time doesn't mean that that person wasn't watching them two or three times prior and some other schmuck was in the parking lot with his white work van and you're like, ah, darn it, I can't grab her this time. So it doesn't mean when you're stalking somebody, it doesn't mean you that's the first time you tried or were thinking of it. So you can be doing a lot of observation or you can just get lucky. You know, you just happen to be pulling into that lot, girl coming out, you're like, dang, there she is. Or if you're the a strange friend, um, it could just be that you wanted to grab her and you just hung around that parking lot and you just, it just worked for you, you know? And maybe if somebody had pulled in, it wouldn't have worked and that would have been the end of that and nothing would have happened that day. Sometimes people get abducted only because they just got that, that, window of opportunity that ki the, the, the killer got the window of opportunity and may he may have never gotten that window of opportunity again and yet he got it that day and so you know sometimes when you think about it it's kind of interesting think about this i might write a book like this but think about it so i i go to i don't know um i go out of my uh, apartment uh I've lived in apartments before. I walk out of my apartment. And there's a guy hiding behind a bush. His vehicle's right there. He's planning to abduct me. He sees me. He's going to abduct me. And all of a sudden, just at that moment, somebody walks out on their balcony and their dog starts barking. And I, the guy can't grab me. So I just get in my car and drive away. And then whatever reasons I moved from that location, the guy never gets a chance at me again. And I go on the rest of my life, not realizing that I was almost murdered that day. I'd have no idea. You know, I think, well, nobody's ever, ever, ever tried anything like that with me. How do I know? If it, if it, did, if it didn't happen to you, you don't know about it. So um, what if she knew the person, got in the car with them? No, uh, her, no, her key was bent and everything's dropped in the parking lot. I don't think they threw the stuff out uh, there. And, and her key was bent. The key, the bent key, and also her, uh, her shoe was sideways in the parking lot. So I don't think so. She was also in a rush, mind you, to get to work. She had a place to go. No, I absolutely 100% believe she was grabbed as she was trying to get in her car. Uh, I don't question that at all. Um, a view, a disgruntled viewer. Mm. Yeah, that's, you know, okay. A lot of people are disgruntled with me. <laughs> I have haters. Okay. I have many, many haters yes they do hate me um but she's not the type that gets haters okay i do because i have very strong opinions on things and i stand up for my opinions and people get who are obsessed with certain things think i'm the devil's own for how dare you say this and you know you're just a, you're i've been told i'm one of them you know part of i was just told i was part of a sex trafficking group because clearly I was trying to say that sex trafficking didn't happen. So therefore I was part of a sex trafficking group. I was part of the problem. So, you know, I got haters. Uh, Jody, not so much. She's just a bubbly, bubbly uh, news anchor. You know, there's no real reason for anybody to hate on her, but stalkers. Oh, you betcha. You betcha. Stalkers. Yeah, definitely. Um, the killer knew her schedule. Yes and no. Likely knew her schedule but also could be lucky. And this is, this is where things get tough that, you know, if you're going to look again, I always talk about the, two, you know, looking two different directions for, for a detective or a profiler. You don't want to ever get rid of the, I, I mean, I just talked about the, the, the girls going missing in Panama and saying, Hey, come on now, stop going over here with a, with a murder thing. But that's because the evidence all points here. In this case, the evidence is there's not evidence whether the guy knew her schedule or not. It's just that, because she had a regular schedule where she left early in the morning for work, it's very possible the guy knew her schedule. But then again, it could be somebody who just happened to be in the parking lot at the time. Uh, 
and found an opportunity. So that's why you have those two things you'd have to keep open. Look at look at people with nowhere schedule, look at the, 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 the weirdo friend, and look at the possibility. It could just be somebody who works in the area. Could be sometimes you have things like um, I always talk about the cousin, you know, because you know, you get these serial killers and they're like they they don't pay the rent. So they get tossed out and then they go call up their sis or their uh, uh, they call up somebody else at auntie and say, hey, can I come and stay at your place? Because, you know, uh, they were really unfair to be here. They took my money, but then they kicked me out. They lie. You know, they lie. And then they go stay with somebody. And while they're staying there, now there's some new person who happens to be there who notices things, especially if you're a serial killer type. You like to watch and see who does what. So, yeah, he might have known her schedule that way or just be that you know, who, yeah, it's very hard to know um, exactly. Um, they, of course, they are going to look at uh, anybody who didn't show up for work, who should have showed up for work, if they can identify them as being in the area. Um, may, like, for example, let's say the guy goes to work himself um, early in the morning. And he gets, he's walking out, he's got his car right there, and, and here comes a pretty girl, and he's like, he can't, can't just can't resist that. So he grabs her, and then he doesn't show up for work, or he shows up for, four hours late possibility um but there's one clear thing the guy had a vehicle i mean that's the kind of evidence you absolutely know the guy had a vehicle because otherwise he couldn't have possibly abducted her uh there's also the possibility there are two people because you could have a driver and a guy who grabs her and throws her into the vehicle and goes in after her to keep her c controlled while the second guy drives away possible don't know um so <laughs> <laughs> oh, the Lisas. <laughs> Francie, there are two Lisas. That's correct. Uh, me, that's Lisa N. Uh, wait, wait. Lisa S in the U.S. and Lisa N in New Zealand. Yes, that is correct. <laughs> we have two Lisas at the moment. So, oh, hi, Annie. Glad to see you here. Um, um, there, there, well, that's a good way to put it. An obsessed, mentally ill viewer. Well, yeah, uh, because because stalkers are pretty pretty obsessed. You know, they really are. Um, let's see. Wait a minute. Okay. Yeah. Because you're saying the abduction theory. No. It, the problem is, it's not that like, she had to know the person to get in their car. And therefore, that's why the abduction theory isn't working out. It's just that it's hard to prove who abducted somebody if you don't have the evidence. And that's where all the, the stories start in so many cases. Because... Now we say, oh, it could have been this, it could have been that, and could obviously it was. Now the I'm surprised I didn't get to it's a police officer because that's the that's the thing you go to when uh, you know so you can't solve a case suddenly now it's a police officer is involved you know that kind of stuff goes on, and it, it's just you know but you know who it was uh, you know it was either a creepy guy who supposedly has an alibi but I find that somewhat questionable or a stalker who's a stalker who was obsessed with her and therefore staked out where she lived or a serial killer who just got lucky. Just don't know. <laughs> what in the world? Hello. Hello. Hello, Annie, the famous square shaped glass provider. No, that, no, no, no. Um, the square, no. Are you, are you talking about this? This is, this is a Christine. This is a Christine uh, uh, glass provider. I need a, why do I need a square plate? <laughs> so much, I need a square plate. <laughs> why? Don't know. Okay. Anyway, that's, that's Jody Houston truth. And I just think they're not probably going to solve the murder unless they get really, really lucky. It's unfortunate. They need to find her body and not finding a body is always, it's a real nightmare. Now I want to read, I want to read you this. This is, this is a lighter side thing. Okay. This was, this one just kind of cracked me up. And then I'll go to the, the Innocence Project thing. But um, let's see. Oh, yeah. This is a Prudy thing. Dear Prudy. And, you know, you, you talk about people with personality disorders and what you want to do about it. Okay. All right. Let's see. All right. Here we go. Dear Prudence, my boyfriend of three years and I are in our late 20s. And we recently moved into a modest house together in the same town as his parents. Prior to that move, I had my own apartment and he lived with his parents. We recently were away for the weekend and I let my boyfriend give our keys to his mother so she could hang a photo for us that she had reframed. Okay, here's the problem right here. 
Just because she reframed it doesn't mean she needs to come into your house and hang it. You can just do that yourself. But okay. When we returned, our entire house had been redecorated. <laughs> new photos on the walls, new pillows on the couches, new kitchen items, and existing kitchen stuff reorganized. Upstairs, there were new pictures over the bed and new towels. All my toiletries had either been replaced or rearranged in my drawer. My closet was rearranged. She also went through my Facebook profile and printed off some photos I had uploaded and framed and hung them. I know this seems nice. No, it doesn't. <laughs> but to me, it just felt invasive. Really? I don't understand how. <laughs> um, I felt completely violated, which you should have. Uh, and I'm embarrassed at some of the things she came across in my bedroom drawers. Uh, my boyfriend doesn't see the problem. Now, there's your problem. See, there's your problem. Uh, she's always been like this with him. Mm-hmm. I guess he's used to it. Okay, if you can get rid of her and take over that you can control your boyfriend in that way, you might have something going for you. Ah, um, and it's causing a lot of tension between us. She spent hours and tons of money. So am I being crazy, ungrateful, or oversensitive? No. You have a person who has completely invaded your privacy. You have a person who has... Uh, has no no uh, idea of what is right and wrong, that what what the uh, what the line should be. She has no respect for you whatsoever. No, you you're in trouble. But I love I love the answer to this. <laughs> so Prudence, this sometimes I don't agree, but I, this this one just made me laugh. And Prudence says you better check your diary. <laughs> she probably annotated it with helpful hints about how her baby boy loves to have his feet rubbed and observations that you sound snappish and oversexed. The only way any of this would make sense is if she were a producer on one of those extreme renovation reality shows. But what you've got is a prospective mother-in-law with no understanding of boundaries. And no understanding of boundaries is complete lack of respect for the other person and a very, very high level of narcissism. So you need to create some. Yeah, like uh, tell the guy to go away and get a new boyfriend. Um, in your case, I think you should... <laughs> I think you should go for, for a moat <laughs> stocked with piranhas and a team of Dobermans. It's a shame that until moving in with you, your boyfriend spent all his adult life with his prying, overbearing mother and apparently thought it was fine. He hasn't grown up enough to understand the gross breaches she's committed. Don't bother asking for your keys back. Surely she's made copies. <laughs> this is such a good answer. <laughs> Just in case. <laughs> just in case. Um, tell your boyfriend you're getting your locks changed and that there also needs to be a change in what is considered acceptable by his mother. If he can't understand your point of view, then he might be happier having mummy tuck him in at night. <laughs> that is one of the best responses I've ever seen. That is, that is so amusing. Oh my goodness. So anyway, uh, <laughs> but this, this, is a, this is a great example, which is why I'm presenting it on the show, not just because it's funny. It's a great example of a very narcissistic personality who pretends they're doing nice things for you and, and get, and they will. I, I talked about the issue of narcissism in the, re, the recent uh, um, show I did and talked about my renter who thought she was doing such nice things for me. And as soon as I didn't think they were as what I wanted, she went overboard. Then she turned, turned and had major vengeance on me because a malignant narcissist like this cannot handle somebody not thanking them constantly for what they're doing for them. And it's, it's, it's very abusive, very controlling, very narcissistic. And uh, she needs a new boyfriend because she doesn't need that woman in her life. Unless she, unless her boyfriend's real, willing to pick up and move to the other side of the world. Uh, she doesn't need to be with that guy. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. That guy was used to his mother doing everything for him. So forget this guy, but even more so, when, when a lot of times when people have grown up with narcissistic parents, they're so used to the narcissism, they actually think it's normal. And they often think that anything they think negative is their fault. Like my mother's the best mother in the world. And oh, I felt a little, you know, my, I once, I thought you shouldn't do that, but I was wrong. And so they're trained. They're trained to believe that this is okay. Because if they, if they dare to say it's not okay, well, then all hell is going to break loose. And you learn very quickly 
very quickly not to challenge a narcissist. Because once you do, you're going to pay. You're going to pay for that. And so, you know, you better learn not to do it. So and that's why you end up. <laughs> this is absolutely correct. She stole my garden. She did. She stole my garden. <laughs> she, she did all kinds of things to me and she stole my garden. Unbelievable. But, you know, um, yeah. So I want people to here to understand that if you are married to or in a relationship or have a parent or even a child who's highly narcissistic and you keep and they keep controlling everything and you are afraid to stand up to them. That's what you're dealing with. And I just think that's a great example of what you're dealing with, you know, so very, very cool example. All right. Now I want to talk about another innocence project thing because I just find them so fascinating and, and, and how we don't actually know what the information is. And this one just came out. Let me find this one. All right. Um, and I've got two. And this is interesting because um, I'm going to try to figure out which one I want to say first. Because, okay, let me do the judge vacates the sentence first. Because this is the kind of thing you will read. All right. Let me tell, show you a picture of this dude. Um, okay. This is this guy. Here he is in prison. His name is Thomas, in quotes, J. Renard James. So Thomas Renard James, but he's called J. There he is. All right. Um, and okay, so let me start with him. All right. A judge in Miami on Wednesday vacated the life sentence of a 55-year-old black man who prosecutors said was wrongfully convicted because of a, a mistaken identity in 1991. I feel good, real good, Thomas J. Renard James said Wednesday as he left a Miami courtroom with his attorneys and family members. James was convicted of the 1990 death of Francis McKinnon, largely on the, okay, now, uh, now I want to point out things to you as I go along, because this is, this is, these are the things people don't catch. Largely on the identification by an eyewitness. Okay, what did he just say, folks? What, what is the, what is the word that you should, should raise a red flag to you. Would somebody like to tell me what the red flag word is? Somebody got it here? I'm going to have my drink while I look for the word. So let's see, what was it again? Um, oh, James was convicted in 1990, death of Frances McKinnon, largely on the identification by an eyewitness who told jurors she watched him gun down her stepfather during a robbery in his Coconut Grove apartment. Ooh. There you go, Carrie. Largely. So not entirely. Largely. Yep, that's it, Molly. Largely, largely, largely. Uh, eyewitness, we're going to get to the eyewitness in a bit, in a bit, but definitely largely. Yeah. Okay. We all got, everybody's got the largely. All right. A lot of times when we read things, and I'm not saying this guy couldn't be innocent. But when we read things in the media and from their lawyers and from their families and whoever's on that innocence project group, they use wording sometimes which people miss largely is one of them, because that means there's something else. Largely could be 51 <laughs> percent. What's the other 49? And I don't know. I could not find the original trial. But anyway. Um, OK, so. Early Wednesday, James, wearing his red prison uniform and shackles, stood behind his mother, Doris Strong, as Miami-Dade State Attorney Catherine Fernandez Rundle detailed a 90-page motion her office filed asking for the conviction to be vacated. And he says, uh, oh, Mom, hopefully the court will grant you the freedom you've been looking for for so many years. Oh, she said that when he, her son started sobbing. Okay. And James, who was 23 when he was convicted, was expected to be released after paperwork was processed Wednesday. It says here, over the past year, Fernandez Rundle said members of her office's Justice Project. They said the Justice Project. And Justice Project, you know, I hate a person who's put in prison wrongly. And I love a concept of a justice project, project, an instance project. The problem I have with it is they often get a tremendous amount of free help from students, law students, and they put in thousands and thousands of hours looking for any little technicality they can get away with. 
not so much that the person necessarily is innocent. Now, if they are innocent, that's great, but that's often not the way it works. Anyway, they poured over 20,000 pages of documents, re-interviewed witnesses. Re-interviewing witnesses, that always becomes a big issue, and it is in this case too. Resubmitted fingerprints and retested DNA samples. She said, the case has gone through numerous appeals, post-conviction reviews, and reviews by a private investigator and the Innocence Project of Florida. This is my, one of my favorite lines. None were successful in finding Mr. Thomas Rainer James innocent until we got involved. Okay, so they couldn't find him innocent. How many people is this? Numerous appeals. That means lawyer after lawyer after lawyer after lawyer. Post-conviction reviews, lawyer after lawyer after lawyer. Reviews by a private investigator brought in by the family, no doubt, or the Innocence Project. And the Innocence Project failed. All of them failed to find him innocent, <laughs> which just boggles my mind. Okay, but she said, until we got involved. All right. In a 90-page motion to vacate the conviction, prosecutors said, what appears to be a chance coincidence that the defendant, Thomas Rayner James, had the same name as a suspect named by witnesses and anonymous tipsters, led to the defendant's photograph being included in a lineup and set in motion a mistaken identity. So the idea is here is that this guy had nothing to do with anything, but because somehow somebody gave a tip about this guy being involved, and it turned out there was another guy with the same name, and he was the wrong guy with that name, and he ended up being in a lineup, and people said, it's you. Okay. Eric, right. months later, James was arrested and charged with murder. At the trial, eyewitness Dorothy Walton told jurors she was sure that James, then 23, pulled the trigger. I'm positive of it. I will never forget his face, she cho told jurors in 1991. All right. Um, and there's no mention. I, I do not know the race of this woman, but I'm only pointing this out because uh, in, in the case, the, the case... Um, Oh, shoot. Somebody tell me what I did that show on. What's that show? <laughs> shoot. Uh, the woman who, uh, the guy got out after, um, oh, crap. Okay, somebody tell me the name of that. Um, the author said she, the, the rape the rape story she told, and now the guy's been let out, and she says she made a mistaken identity. Oh, come on. I did a whole show on it. <laughs> I do too many shows now. I can't remember. Uh, the Lovely Bones Lady. Uh, Alice Seabold. Okay, it's coming back. Alice Seabold uh, was a white female who was raped during college by a black male. Um, and then she pointed, she ID'd him. He went to prison for years and then was exonerated. And she says she, I guess just she picked the wrong dude in the lineup. Okay, so it was, a lot was made of, a lot was made of the fact she was white and he was black. Not as a racial thing, mind you, necessarily. Just that if you're a white person around white people, you might be unable to tell differences in another race. Like you're more familiar with white facial structures, Caucasian facial structures. And, and you, therefore when you see black facial structures, you just don't, doesn't register as well to you um, or Asian or Hispanic or whatever, and vice versa. If you're, you're a black person and you're not around white people very much, you might have trouble. Now, personally, I can't tell blonde white women apart to save my life. I mean, they'll look the same to me, <laughs> but I have, what is is sometimes known as um, facial blindness. Um, and that's an interesting point. Uh, but before I make that point, I want to point out this, that they're not saying anything here about her being white and, 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 and the suspect being black, and therefore she misidentified him because she wasn't comfortable with, with the racial features. So I'm going to, I think she might be black too. So if that's true, then this isn't, this, this argument can't be used. Although, as I say, it's hard to tell people apart. Let me show you the photo. He actually put this picture up. On he wrote a little letter, and, and, and this is what this was his letter. You compare Thomas Rayner James claims he was mistakenly convicted of murder based on his identity being confused with that of a man named Thomas James, the alleged mass accomplice of oh, this guy named Williams, uh, during the robbery gone bad that ended with Mr. McKinnon's murder. The men's physical attributes are eerily similar. Okay, now I'm looking at these two dudes, and I'm like, 
Actually, I don't think they're that similar. So I, I find that kind of funny that they're trying to say they're very similar. Um, they're the right same height, um, five year difference in age. Um, I don't know. The guy, one guy's got his head up in the air, so I can't quite tell if they look that similar. His eyebrows look, hey, wait, but don't his eyebrows look completely different to you? His, okay, the dude on the left, uh, the dude on the left, which is Thomas Rainer James, the guy just got out. See how, see how close his eyebrows are? Look at the dude on the right. His eyebrows are like, man, you could have a football field between his eyebrows. Okay, so I'm going to say these dudes don't look anything alike. And I don't know if that guy's a pointed head or not on the right either. I don't know. Um, I personally don't think that they look that alike. But that's just me. And I have a facial blindness problem. In general, I have trouble telling people's faces apart. Uh, I don't seem to be able to pick out uh, these you know, things very often, unless I'm sitting there literally trying to point it out like I just did. Uh, there was an interesting article. Uh, I just wanted to bring that up here. Uh, it's called, and it's, it was Brad Pitt. So a Brad Pitt article. It's kind of cool. And it call, it's called, it's from the Today, Today Show, is, is facial blindness real? Brad Pitt says he has, I can't pronounce it, pro, prosopagnosia, prosopagnosia, but it hasn't been diagnosed. He says it's a rare disorder that makes it difficult to rec recognize faces. Now, people with severe, supposedly severe problems with this can look in a mirror and say, who the hell is that? <laughs> some, some person in my house. I don't know who they are. Um. I think I said more like Alzheimer's, but okay. Um, but there, it, this, they talk about the continuum. It's an ability to recognize people's faces, even people you know. And I have definitely suffered from that. Let me tell you. Um, uh, uh, so what happens is, <laughs> it says he fears that his problem with recognizing people leads to a certain impression of him, that he's remote and aloof and inaccessible, self-absorbed. But the truth is he wants to remember the people he meets and is ashamed he can't. I have to fake it all the time. Uh, and, and also the more people you meet, especially if you're doing television work, the less you, less you can remember. Um, the same reason I can't remember all the cases. <laughs> I blank and I go, is it Alzheimer's or is it just, I have, you know, so many cases and so many people's names and I just, they're out of my head. Okay. So he thinks, um, what is, what is prosopagnosia, AKA facial blindness? trouble recognizing facial identity in the absence of low level vision problems. So in other words, you don't have a, you don't have a physical problem with your eyes. You just go, is that my kid? <laughs> is that my friend? Hmm. Is that a person I met last week and don't, they don't recognize them. Okay. If you look in the general population, there's a spectrum of face recognition abilities. Most of us fall somewhere in the middle. Some people are fantastic. You know, they, crazy. They can remember like, I met you 20 years ago and I know who you are. Like, really? I met you 10 minutes ago and I don't remember you. All right. We call those people super recognizers. And then people who are really on the low end are called prosopagnosics. Maybe the last 2%. So in other words, it's a, it's a, it's a continuum. Um, I, I suppose I am not quite in the middle. I am a little bit toward that end of not recognizing too well. Now, the reason I bring this up is for this reason. Some people are great at recognizing people just like that. Some people are not. So eyewitness reports are always questionable. Now, this woman was in the location when her, what was it, who was being shot here? Um, hold on one second. Let me pull back the article here. Okay, judge. All right, all right. Uh, so, hold on a second. Oh, okay, Dorothy Walton. Uh, she was sure that James, then 23, pulled the trigger. I'm positive of it. I will never forget his face. All right. Now, years later, this is where they come and re-interview people years later. Well, years later, you can't remember how you knew it was that person. You can't remember it. It's, it's, it's so long ago. Now you start questioning yourself. And believe you me, when the Innocence Project type people show up and the lawyers try to show up and try to get you somebody out of prison, they'll look at you and they're going to say, do you really know that was the guy? Could you have been mistaken? And that's an old lawyer trick. Could you have been mistaken? What are you supposed to say? No way. You know, I'm never mistaken about anything. You know, <laughs> I'm always perfect. Of course, 
the point when could you be mistaken? The answer is almost always has to be yes to be a rational, decent human being. So once they point that question at you, could you have been mistaken? And you open the door to possibly, then they start picking on you to the point where you start thinking maybe his eyebrows were farther apart. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I didn't see quite as well as I should have. Maybe I this, maybe I that. And you start attacking the victim, uh, the witness, the witness, until the point where they can no longer feel comfortable saying they had the right person. And then when you, you add to that a huge number of people, family, lawyers, the Innocence Project, everybody trying to save this poor man, and you are the one, you put this poor man in prison for 30 some years. You ruined his life. He was a young man and you ruined his life. You know, you don't think that's a guilt trip and a half and that you start thinking, oh my God, you know, maybe I was wrong. <laughs> I better say I was wrong because maybe if I'm wrong and the guy at least comes out now, I don't have to be the worst human being on the face of the earth. Maybe he can reclaim some of his life. You see, you put that guilt trip on people, they'll fall apart. So anyway, so anyway, it says here, Walter's testimony was key to the jury's verdict because there was no physical evidence tying anyone to the killing, said Rundle. In fact, fingerprints from the scene did not match James. Yeah, because there were a lot of fingerprints at the scene. That's all. Um, but beginning last fall, Walton said she had some concerns about her testimony. Fernandez R Rundle said she initially refused to meet with prosecutors, but earlier this month made contact and said now she believes she made a mistake in identifying James as the gunman. Fernandez Rundle said that over the years, there have been conflicting stories about detectives confusing James with another man who shared his names. But that man had been arrested and was in jail at the time of the shooting, she said. What? Well, let me reread that sentence again. But that man had been arrested and was in jail at the time of the shooting. So they confused his name with another man, but that man was already in jail when the shooting happened? So what does it matter? I don't even understand that. Okay. The man suspected of killing McKinnon died in 2020, they said. All right. Now, it will get more interesting. Now, that's that's one. So that's what you might read. And you go, oh, my God, you know, poor guy, all this stuff. All right. Now we go to this article, which is where I went. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> all right. This one. Okay. Let me show you her name. Her, there's a new attorney. And her name is Natalie Figures. Okay. Uh, she's one of these gung, very gung ho ish people. Um, she, she's gung ho about, you know, getting people. And she, I'll tell you a story in a minute so you can see. And I'm not saying she's a bad person. She, she might have a heart of gold. You know, here she is. There's the guy, that, no, there's the guy that was convicted. There's the woman who apparently helped clear an innocent man of murder sentence after 32 years in prison. Okay. Now, let's, let me tell you this story. She logged 2,000 hours working for free to exonerate Thomas Renard James after misidentification. Again, there was no proof of misidentification, only that somebody thought they might have misidentified after 35 years. Uh, and suspect, and suspect, you mean, I got a burp. Uh, suspect police work sent him to prison in Florida. All right, now, listen to the story here. It gets really interesting toward the end. A Miami lawyer was able to transform the life of a man who, who spent 32 years behind bars for a crime he did not commit. It hasn't been proven he didn't commit it, by the way. Just they, they are just finding that there wasn't proper evidence to convict. So also understand that when they say he didn't commit it, they don't have proof he didn't commit it. And said his, her own life has been transformed in the process. Thomas Renard James had been in prison 30 years by the time Natalie Figures a lawyer only two years out of law school was approached by friends of his who were raising money for his defense in 2020. When you say friends of his, you've been in prison that long. You probably don't have friends. I'm going to say as part of the justice type groups, the innocence project type groups. So his, those are his friends. I don't think they're like his friends from like, like the, the, the neighborhood, you know what I mean? Um, all right. Figures 32 is em 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 empathetic, but apprehensive. She was a business and personal injury attorney. James' case required a criminal lawyer, but Figures learned no one would take his case. 
not because no one believed he was innocent. Uh, the few attorneys who were interested still required fees that made them inaccessible to James, known as Jay, to his friends. All right. She agreed to read up on the case weeks before she gave birth to her son. What she read convinced her that she should, despite her lack of experience, try to help James. And so just six weeks after her son was born, she began an 18-month investigation that would consume her. She banged on doors and rang doorbells. She poured over heaps of paperwork. She cold-called people who testified in the 99 murder of Francis McKinnon and others related to the case, driving hundreds of miles to gather information and talk to at least 75 people about the case in person. Now, mind you, this is 30 some years later. So I don't remember what I ate for lunch, much less what happened 30 years ago. So, you know, when you're talking about recollections of anything, let's take, for example, just a simple one while we're, while we're here, children being born, the birth of a child, you know, I remember certain details about the birth of my children. But the other details I haven't got a clue about. So if you asked me, for example, what did the nurse look like who was, was at the attendance of you know, the birth of your daughter? I go, I don't know. I just wanted to punch her in the face. That's all I can tell you. You know, <laughs> that she was a, really not a very nice person. Um, I don't remember what the doctor's name was. I don't, I thought he was a jerk too. So anyway, there wasn't, a, I had my daughter born, she was born in a hospital in California and I had to fight them tooth and nail not to get drugged up and get a C-section. And I did end up having a natural birth, uh, but only because I fought and I was like 24 years old and it was not pleasant. Um, but I have, you know, flashes of memory. But if you ask me if all the details of what happened in the hospital, I don't know all those details. I only know the big interesting ones. So you ask people all these questions, what happened 30 some years ago? They put that to rest. A lot of them don't remember anything, you know? So that's a problem when you go back that late and, and then try to say, Oh, see, you know, this is what this person says. Memory doesn't get better. It gets worse. So your memory is freshest right after something happens, not 30 years later. At that point, it becomes really questionable whether you're remembering anything correctly. So anyway, she did all this interview to build his case. Okay. Okay. So then it goes on. Figures shared all the information she uncovered with the Conviction Review Unit, an entity under the Florida Justice Institute established in Miami in 1991 to identify, prevent, and reverse wrongful convictions. You say, so this is their whole job, and they get lots of money to do such a thing. Not lots of money to do the right thing. Lots of money to do the thing. The review unit assesses the provided evidence, and if a convincing case is made, recommends a person's release from prison. Figures piled on the evidence. Piled on the evidence. Okay. And even though she believes she has su supplied enough evidence in 2021 for him to walk free, she continued to dig. I couldn't stop until he was out. So I kept giving them more, you know, more and more evidence. This, you know, there's only so much evidence. <laughs> there isn't mountains of evidence. So I don't know where your mountains of evidence are coming from because there's only so much evidence. All right. Um, but then you go back. Okay. For starters, nine of the fingerprints found at the scene of the crime, none belong to James. That doesn't matter if he's, if he, if he walks in, he's, I don't know if he had gloves on, if he walks in, he has a gun, he shoots doesn't mean that you leave fingerprints everywhere. So it's not even so. And if you have a lot of people coming and going out of your house, you're, you've got fingerprints of like 200 people in your house. Um, police and prosecutors relied on the testimony of Dorothy Wilson, the victim's stepdaughter, who was there at the time of the murder and identified James as a shooter. All right. Now it gets more interesting here. All right. Uh, the reality was... The reality, I love the reality part, uh, was another man named Thomas James lived nearby and had a violent criminal past. He was also friends with Vincent Williams, the other man convicted of robbing McKinnon that night. I don't know if he means he was friends with him or he, both of the guys were friends with the guy. I don't know, but all right. Um, and they, the Coral uh, Gables police learned those names through a tip line when they searched Thomas James in their criminal database. And they found instead Thomas Renard James, who check this out, toiled in the drug trade and had a gun possession charge. So you see, he was not a nice guy. This guy was a, a local sleazebag criminal, okay? He's a drug dealer. He had uh, illegal weapons. He's not a nice guy, okay? He's a scumbag. All right. 
Police tagged him as McKinnon's murderer, despite there being no physical evidence he had been at the scene. Apparently, there was no physical evidence the other guy had been at the scene. So decades later, figures brought witnesses who connected the other one, Thomas James, to Williams, the established robber. Okay, they're all people that live in the neighborhood. So you can always find someone who will say, oh, yeah, he knew. Uh, James contends that a case of mistaken identity and less than thorough police work ruined his life, adding that the detectives did not follow up with the witness's claim that would have cleared his name. When he was arrested months after the murder, police used that he could not remember where he was on the night of the crime against him. Okay, I'll give him that because it is true. And he points this out here. Who remembers where they were a given night five months ago? I will agree with that entirely. This is true. Um, you know, that's, that's ridiculous. And that's one of the most important things about running down everything quickly, getting people's alibis. Because, yeah, you're not going to remember where you were. That's just impossible. Now... This is an interesting statement. What do you notice in this statement? Okay. I never asked anybody to believe what I was saying, James said. What I did was say for any and everybody to simply admit that if what, if what I was saying was true, that I had been wrongly convicted. Wait a minute. Hold on a second. I never asked anybody to believe what I was saying. What I did was say for any and everybody to simply admit that if what I was saying was true, that I've been wrongly convicted. If I was saying what I was saying was true. <laughs> okay. If you're only, if they believed what you were saying, what if they didn't believe what you were saying? Well, then you maybe weren't wrongly convicted. Anyway, that goes on here. Let's see. So anyway, uh, so the, so the woman, the, uh, Let's see here. Oh, Dorothy Wilson, the prosecutor's cr critical, crucial Wilson, uh, witness. She didn't want to give any statements, figure said of Wil Wilson. She didn't want to talk to people for years. Well, she shouldn't have to. I, why would she want to? When I went to interview her, she cracked the door open. I knew at that time she was giving me an opportunity to show her why she should do the right thing. What right thing? You haven't even interviewed the woman yet. You don't know whether she was mistaken in her identity identifying this guy. So how could you do the right thing before you even knew that she didn't did the wrong thing? How do you even know she did the wrong thing? <laughs> it was an emotional point for me. I couldn't help but cry to her. And I told her, if God tells you to give me a call when I leave, please give me a call. I'm going to answer. But I'm doing this because he is an innocent person. And I'm doing this because God put me here. Well, that's surely a fine proper objective investigation. Wow. 10 minutes later, she called me. I was driving. I pulled over and she asked me, why did you cry like that? Who is he to you? Are you related to him? And I said, no. And she asked him, are you paying? Is he paying you? And I said, no, I'm doing this pro bono. She asked me, how did I know it wasn't him? And I said, because I know. And she said, I know it wasn't him too. Really? Really? She didn't know it wasn't him too. How would she know that? Because she identified him as the guy. There's no reason why 30 years later, she should think it wasn't him because let's put it this way. Let me put these pictures back up again. All right. Where, where, where are the pictures of these dudes? Okay. So let's actually say it was the guy on the right, not the guy on the left. How would you know? 30 years later, that you were wrong about identifying the guy on the left when it was the guy on the right. How would you know that? Would you actually remember? Oh, that's right, you know. I think I was wrong about those eyebrows. I think I was wrong about that hairline. How would you know? I mean, it's, how would you know? Because it's 30 years ago. How would you know you misidentified him? It's impossible. So this woman was... She was, she, somebody, somebody played her and I'm going to say it's this lawyer lady. Okay. So then they, the judge in Miami ruled James had been wrongfully in prison for 32 years based on absolutely no evidence, except that now you have a, a witness who says I was wrong because somebody made her feel bad. And so though, anyway, he gets, um, he gets out and let's see. Oh, 
It's the same figures goes for her. She said she's also realized that being emotionally connected to her clients' cases can be effective. Well, yeah, uh, that's wrong, though, because you shouldn't be emotionally connected to a case that is supposed to be about evidence and not your personal little feelings about it. I don't get pers I don't get emotionally attached to any cases I ever work for that reason, because if I do, I'm doing it wrongly. You know, I get emotionally attached to my family, my friends. And yes, I do. I have emotions. Yes, I do. But I don't allow it to interfere with my cases because once I start doing that, objectivity is out the window and that is wrong. Okay. So anyway, he's, he's now um, living with his mother and let's see, uh, let's see. So anyway, now he's, the family has launched a website, Justice for Jay. He is going to get, oh, apparently this is interesting. Um, under the law, Florida provides a minimum of $50,000 in compensation for every year someone is wrongfully convicted in prison with a maximum of $2 million. However, a de defendant is ineligible to risk compensation if they have been convicted of another violent felony, which James has. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Does, does, did somebody catch that? Remember, he was a drug, a drug dealer, right? He, was, he had a weapon. He had a weapons charge. What did you just hear that we didn't hear before? What do we not hear before that we just heard at the end of this article? Does somebody want to point that out? Because I think that's just, I didn't even see this in the article before. So I'm like, really interesting. Why isn't he getting compensation? Is it because he was a drug dealer? No. Is it because he had a gun? No. No, it's not. No, it's not the criminal record. He can still get money if he has, if he, what they said before is he's a drug dealer and he had, he was in possession of an illegal weapon. That's not why, that's not why he's getting, he can't get any money. What did they just say? Re, let, let me read it again. Florida law prohibits him from filing a lawsuit against the case and he can't receive compensation if they've been convicted of another, no, 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 not drug dealing. Violent felony, violent felony. Okay, violent felony. All right, so this guy wasn't doing a little bunch of misdemeanor crap. Yes, there you go. He was convicted of a violent felony. Not a violent one. <laughs> I, I love typing that. <laughs> a violent felony. Yeah, you know, that color really will do you in. <laughs> I love you, Lila. Glad you're here. Um, violent felony. So now we've got a guy, see, Mr. Innocent, so when he starts out, you're like, oh, poor dude. Why did he get in? Why, what happened to him? Okay, one, he's a drug dealer. Two, he carries around illegal weapons. Now we find out at the end of the article, he's a violent offender who probably should be in prison. You know? <laughs> oh, no, no, Lila, I like laughing. <laughs> God knows I can't speak straight, so why would it be? <laughs> it might be a pink one next time. Yeah. That could be. <laughs> so a violent felony. So now we have more information. I don't know how long this guy's record is. We're going to say he's a career criminal. So this isn't Mr. Nice Guy. This is a guy who was a was a was an absolute menace to the community and was a violent offender. So, oh, they were they were so wrong in thinking he might have killed this guy when he owned a, a legal weapon and was a violent offender already. That was before he went to prison. I mean, he didn't. Get, he, didn't he wasn't a violent offender afterwards. So he already had a, a, a record of carrying a weapon illegally and being a violent offender. So, so now we're going to say the police were wrong to look at him. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So anyway, he's out and she's dancing. I got him out. I got him out. <sighs> so, again. I can't say, uh, I'm just, every time I look at these cases, you know, again, I, you know, I, there are people I know in prison who did not commit their crime and I want them out because there's nothing, I do not like a wrongful prosecution. I don't, you know, I don't, I don't like wrongdoing by, by our, especially our legal authorities, but I also don't like people doing things to get people out of prison who are actually guilty of the crimes they committed and, and lying about the issues. And so in this particular case, I think that 
they basically let this guy out of prison based on the fact that after 30 some years, a very, very aggressive attorney got the witness to recant. Um, and so now the guy's free. And every, now, and now everybody's saying he's innocent. That is not true. Just because somebody said after 30 years, oh, I guess I misidentified him, doesn't make the guy innocent. And I don't see that he is. I don't see there's any proof he is. And it just frustrates the heck out of me because, you know, I keep, I'm, I'm, I'm always open to finding one that I go, oh, dang, they finally did the right thing. Look at this. This guy shouldn't have been in prison. They got really great evidence. And he, you know, sometimes what will happen is, uh, they got a guy out of prison and they'll say the DNA didn't match him and it didn't. Um, and you think, oh, you know, poor guy got nailed for, for a horrific rape, maybe a, a, a rape and murder. And he's been in prison 20 years, something he didn't do. And you feel really bad for him. And then when you actually look into his history, you find out that he's committed 20 rapes. It's just not that one. <laughs> and in which case I'm like, that's not the same thing either. Yes, he shouldn't have been convicted for what he didn't do, but He's not a nice guy either. So don't start saying, oh, isn't it wonderful? He's finally getting another chance at life. Unlike the 20 women he raped, maybe murdered. So mm. <laughs> he's, he, he's guilt. Uh, as my boyfriend in the 90s would say, he's guilty of something. He was guilty of something. Um, well, he was guilty of a lot of things and felonies. So I, uh, I have this issue about when people seem to think that it's not a big deal when somebody crosses the line to do certain things. And I'm always like, look, I don't understand how anybody steals anything from somebody. I don't understand how anybody commits, sells uh, drugs to people, especially children. I don't have a lot of forgiveness for that kind of crap. This isn't some minor thing or like, you know, children are starving. So you stole a loaf of bread. I, I, I don't have a lot of love for people crossing the line to commit horrific crimes against other human beings. I know just the concept of somebody stealing something from you. You know, I, I, many people will say this. I felt so invaded just because somebody came in, somebody's in my home and they lifted something out of my house and just, you just can't, it's just so upsetting because they knew that was your thing. They knew it was yours and they took it anyway. And, I, I could never do that to somebody. I couldn't go to somebody's house and say, man, that, that's a really, I really like this thing. I'll just put it in my pocket because I know it's not mine. And that would hurt that person. And they're going to wake up and they're going to find that thing that they like gone. How do you do that to somebody? So I, I don't have a, I, I lack sympathy <laughs> in criminal behavior. I just do. I just do. So anyway, mm, um, <laughs> Can we put people in prison for being no good pieces of shit? <laughs> so, sometimes I wish. But, you know, here's a po really important point, Lila. Apparently, there was just these guys were just caught with, what, $150,000 worth of fentanyl? No, 150,000 fentanyl pills or something like that. And the judge in California just gave them um, uh, gave them bail. I'm like, what? The guy, they had enough. They could have killed half the entire state of California with that crap. I mean, how can you let these guys out? These guys are murder. They, the drug itself is they're murdering people. I'm sorry. Yeah, I think they're pieces of crap that should be in there until they get sentenced. I don't like people hurting other people. That's my little. Okay, I had. Let's see. One other thing I want to talk about. Uh, okay, talked about the main things. So if you're still here and now you're getting bored, <laughs> do like and subscribe to the channel because. I need to keep going here and not have my channel crash and burn. Um, uh, this was a really good statement about uh, child trafficking. And I just, it, it, it continues to drive me crazy. Mom, I just mentioned this issue about this. As it says, as conspiracy theories and myths, this is a statement on misinformation about child trafficking. I keep trying to point this out. Uh, as conspiracy theories and myths about child sexual abuse and child trafficking circulate online, this group, the New Jersey Coalition Against Sexual Assault, strongly urges our friends, allies, and community members to fight misinformation and learn more about the reality of child sexual abuse. Because it does exist. Children are abused. Children are sexually abused. And so children, and some when they say children, a lot of times they actually mean teenagers. 
Nothing wrong with saying teenagers are children, but too many times when they say child sex trafficking, they actually mean almost all teenagers. And everybody, for some reason, this this um, this this big myth going out is that all these children, are like six, seven, eight years old, three year old babies, you know what I mean? They're all little teeny children, all being raped and stuff. Most of them are teenagers, homeless, drug using, runaways, teenagers. It's a big, it's still an important thing as I keep pointing out. There's nothing wrong with saying we got to stop this, but don't give out the misinformation. Now, interesting enough, now it says here, um, uh, here's the real truth about sex trafficking of children, child, child trafficking. Myth, hundreds of thousands of children are trafficked in the U.S. each year. And I just had somebody had to block uh, on, on the John Walsh, Megan Walsh issue um, because Megan Walsh says, you know, that her dad and their, his organization are trafficking children sexually. It's just uh, insane. And, but then somebody writes, you just, you're, again, I'm part of the establishment problem, apparently. Um, so establishment. But anyway, uh, that I would say this is, we do not have a massive little children sex trafficking problem in the United States. Other countries do that are highly highly a lot of poverty where children are literally sold and kidnapped in other countries it doesn't happen here um, very rarely now here's the fact there are no hard numbers on the prevalence of child trafficking in the u.s child protective uh, service age, wait a minute in the u.s okay child protective service agencies in 27 states reported a total of 751 child victims of sex trafficking in 2018 that's not hundreds of thousands. That's 751. And when I say when they say child victims, again, child is could be 17 years old. Um, while these figures are likely influenced by underreporting, that's true too. They indicate that child trafficking is far less widespread than believed. Higher figures that circulate online are often pulled from reports of missing children, the majority of which involve cases of runaways, not trafficking. Then we get the myth they're trafficked by strangers. No, that's not usually true. There's usually grooming and then there's not, not really forced abduction. They're just coerced because they're runaways and so on and so forth. Um, uh, so often shelter drugs. That's why children, which are really usually teens, uh, by someone under the age of 18. And that's that. And all that. Here's another one. Myth. All children are equally at risk of being trafficked. No. Like all forms of sexual violence, child trafficking disproportionately affects marginalized groups of people. Traffickers often target victims who are low income or vulnerable. Uh, gay, gay, gay youth, uh, five times more likely than heterosexual youth to be victims of trafficking. Children who are runaways and experience homelessness face higher risk of being, quote, trafficked, which is basically being getting into prostitution and, uh, and having to participate in sexual stuff with, with other human beings. Who aren't very human um so anyway this is the kind of garbage i'm trying to fight against because we have a family problem we have a stability problem we have a, sometimes a poverty and drug problem is huge and a lack of uh, women having children without a supportive family a, a partner of some sort where they're just raising children under conditions which are very bad um, all of this stuff put together leads to an instability in, in, in the home life where the child gets into drugs, gets in with bad people, uh, gets into looking for money, runs away from home, all that stuff. So we have a problem. But if we don't look at the actual problem and spend all the time with these ridiculous conspiracy theories where the entire government is involved in uh, some satanic sexual stuff and you know, foster services, uh, social services is kidnapping kids out of people's homes. That's just nonsense. Stop doing it. Stop doing it. It's crazy. <sighs> anyway. Okay. So that was, what, I have one more thing I want to do before I go in the house. I want to look at what you're saying here. Um, what? What's happening to Annie? What's happening, Annie? Okay. Well, somebody got their count hit. Not really. I, what? I was robbed of $500 a day for somebody who took my credit card number and used it on PayPal. Really? Luckily, you can usually fight that. Uh, I've had very good luck fighting that with the banks and PayPal. So you usually should be able to survive that, which really sucks. Boy, I hate those people. Um, <laughs> uh, see, I hate criminals. I hate criminals. Okay, one more thing I want to do before I go is... 
something. Oh, 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 this I thought was really great. And it's, thank you, Australia. Um, where is it, where is it, where is it? Uh, hold on a second. Aha, here we go. Okay. I've talked a lot about Munchausen syndrome by proxy. And one of the problems I have with the term myself is that I keep telling people, it's not a psychological thing. It's the person who I call them exhibiting, exhibiting behaviors, what that should be called Munchausen syndrome by proxy, but they themselves do not have, have like a disease Munchausen syndrome by proxy. Now, in case you don't understand what I'm talking about, Munchausen syndrome is what they call it when a, a, a person, oftentimes a woman, um, pretends she's ill or makes herself ill in order to get attention. Um, sometimes she'll say she's been raped. Uh, sometimes she'll just, you know, say, just go in the doctor and, oh, I have this, I have a lump in my, I felt, I felt a lump. Uh, I, 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 she comes up with all kinds of crap. My stomach hurts when it doesn't because she wants attention from people. Uh, and she, 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 they can go into some real Munchausen syndrome. They can go in, like say, accusing people of rape, accusing people of all kinds of weird stuff. Uh, it has been, I think, wrongly done for years. It's always bugged me that they'll say this person has Munchausen syndrome, like it's some kind of psych psych psychological issue. I'm like, no, it's not. That's a behavior of a psychopath. It's just a behavior. And the reason it's often women is because it's a female, it's generally speaking, societal wise, it's a female behavior because a lot of guys have got attention differently, but women often get attention through sympathy. And so then we have Munchausen syndrome by proxy, which is where you hurt your children or you claim your children are injured or sick to get attention by way of your children, which includes killing your babies. So the people go, oh my God, your baby died of SIDS. And then you get attention and you get a good funeral and then you can get pregnant again and start the whole process over. And then the person has, they say the person has Munchausen syndrome by proxy. I'm like, no, they don't have it. They exhibit it. They're psychopaths. They're serial, the women who kill their babies, they're serial killers. They just use this method. And I've never seen this before, and I'm excited to see it, even though apparently it came out in 2005. <laughs> so, but in Australia, not in the US. It says here, a new name for Munchausen syndrome by proxy, defining fabricated or induced illness by carers. Now, this is some, it's a very long abstract, okay? And I'm not going to go into the, all that, but... Since mid-2004, uh, the National Child Protection Clearinghouse has had several queries in relation to Munchausen syndrome by proxy. Okay. Then it goes on about the, the terminology. Hmm. Let me see where I found this thing. I thought it was really cool. The deliberate, pro pro the deliberate production or fabrication of physical or psychological symptoms in a child by a parent or carer is defined as fabricated or induced illness by carers, FIC. Sorry, got to do some sign language. F I I C, F I I C, fabricated or induced illness by carers. Okay, that's a phenomenon previously known as Munchausen syndrome by proxy. Now, do you notice the difference? One is a behavior, a fabricated or induced illness by carers. That's a that's a behavior as opposed to oh, you have Munchausen syndrome by proxy. I love it. Or a factitious of a uh, factitious disorder by proxy is another term or factitious to our Meadows syndrome. I never heard of that one. Okay. All right. So then they go on about all this. Okay. The older Munchausen syndrome by proxy label is now undergoing intense scrutiny worldwide. I don't think so. I think Australia, you're probably my, I don't know if it, I don't know how it worked in Australia, but I haven't heard it change any place. Still bugs me. Um, so they were taught, what they're basically talking about here is that, um, that the problem is when you define the person's personality as Munchausen syndrome, you're, 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 you're trying to then psychologically determine if this is true, as opposed to just the behavior being true. You know, um, if I murder somebody, you don't have to worry about whether I'm a psychopath or a narcissist or, or a thrill seeker. We don't have to worry about that. I did it. <laughs> if, if I, if I murdered the person, I am a murderer of that person. I committed a murder and that's all we really have to worry about. You know, I mean, I, yeah, people want to know if you're sane or insane. That's another legal definition, but 
the point being that instead of going into whether the person has a psychological condition of any sort, you can just look at the behaviors. And this I think is extremely important because it gets rid of a lot of this argument over what is their real problem? I, you know, do they, do they, do they know what they're doing or not? Yeah. They're killing their kids. They know what they're doing. <laughs> so, yeah. and so I think this is a great idea, but this was in 2005 and also they're using it for social services. So instead of having to, uh, diagnose the, the the carer they can say they don't care what the diagnosis is they're concerned about what the carer is doing to children and we can use that as a basis for it, removing children or saving children's lives and not have to go through a whole psychological you know evaluation for like months on end while the kid is being killed you know so i think that's really great i but i just don't i'm gonna look now to see whether this has like influenced any place else and whether it even is actually because i didn't realize it was 2005 i'm like really this is like almost 20 years ago and yet i haven't seen any change around the world so yeah but i thought that was really kind of fascinating i was like oh cool very very interesting um, oh oh let me let, let me do one one more thing because i promised barbara i'd do this barbara's not here oh, anyway uh, barbara said i just learned about a 2017 study at the university of someplace in england <laughs> I'm not going to pronounce it because I know I'm going to screw it up someplace in England that found 94% of homicides involve stalking. I thought it'd be an interesting topic for you. Here's an article about it. And, and I, I like this one. This is interesting, Barbara. I, I agree. This is interesting, but I, I think it's a little deceptive. It says here, stalking behaviors have been identified in nine out of 10 murders by criminologists. Um, well, it depends what kind of murder it is. I mean, you know, there's a lot of murders that have nothing to do with stalking. I, I don't understand where they even come up with this. I mean, husbands murder wives. They're not stalking them. Um, uh, there's there's all kinds of gang killings and stuff like that. And robberies gone bad. There's a ton of killings that have nothing to do with stalking. I, I All I can assume here is they're talking about serial, the serial rapists and serial murderers. Well, Yeah. I mean, but then they're saying here, stalking is an obsession, which, which can increase risk and severity and needs to be addressed. So here's say here, it says here, stalking could present itself in acts such as re, such as rearranging a victim's garden furniture <laughs> or that lady in that her boyfriend's, her son's girlfriend's house. Um, sending unwanted gifts, loitering on the pavement outside their house or calling social services to maliciously report poor parenting. Well, that is stalking, but the stalking doesn't usually end up in murder. And, and, and serial, all this stalking behavior isn't, isn't very normal for serial rapists or murderers. I mean, it isn't, they, they might observe and they might stalk in the sense that they're watching their behavior. So they know when they can get them, but I don't, and sometimes they will enter their homes and play around with their, their, their underwear in the drawer and stuff like that, like, you know, peeping Toms. But this, this to me, they're, they're talking about uh, stalking turning into escalation. Well, yeah, you want to be careful about stalking turning into escalation, but I don't understand why stalking behavior identified 94% of murders. This is where I think really, you, you, you know, folks in doing criminal justice stuff and doing research, really, that is garbage. I mean, I, it's, a, it's a terrible article, but I like the fact that Barbara was pointing it out because she thought this is really interesting, but it's not accurate in any way, shape or form. I don't know where they come up with this absolute convoluted mess. Uh, so sometimes you got to be careful too with studies. <laughs> That's my point on that. Oh, Lord. Um, let's see what we have here. Um, I'm not sure. I'm going. I'm going back here to see where where which we're, which we're talking about here. Um, I know a lot of you are talking about PayPal. I do use PayPal personally. I do use. Uh, I'm going to say this. I know you're talking about issues with PayPal. PayPal being awful and losing money and stuff. I have used PayPal for a lot of things, and I find it very. I've never had a problem in, in, in over a decade. Neither have I had a problem on Facebook, Twitter, bank accounts. I mean, I either I'm really freaking lucky or just 
it is not as prevalent as people think it is. Um, and a lot of those things are things you can fight back. Um, uh, so on eBay, I use eBay all the time too. Um, so I don't know. It, it's, I don't know when people run into the problems and I'm not saying they don't exist um, because, uh, you know, it's online transfers, but um, I haven't found anything that I think, because you're asking here, um, would you suggest are there some safer alternatives to PayPal? I, again, I've never had a problem. And then there's, there's all kinds of uh, vendors and I don't know that any of them are like 100% perfect, but usually they're fightable. Usually you can fight them. Um, usually you can fight them. Um, I have had less problems with, uh, for example, I've used um, uh, Airbnb. I fought, I fought against that. Uh, a, a guy that overcharged me a ridiculous thing. And Air, uh, pay, Airbnb was only a half asked, okay, help me out a little bit, but not fully. And I went to my bank and the bank just, Wells Fargo just gave me my money back. Um, I've never had a problem with getting my money back that way. Uh, for some reason, actually, it's a lot easier um, dealing with online stuff in some senses than in real life stuff. Um, I'm fighting to get paid by a TV production company. I was ripped off for two thousand dollars by CNN. I was ripped off a thousand dollars by MSNBC. Three hundred dollars by a Canadian production company, and now I have a uh, an Irish production company who owes me twelve, thirteen hundred dollars, and decided they're not going to answer my emails, even though I have a contract. But where do you go with the contract? How do you fight that? You know what and what you know. So that's why you know <laughs> everything. Everything that you do, unless you can fight it. Um, it's always an issue. Uh, and then the question is IRS. They just ask you for money. What are you going to do? You're going to fight that? Oh, you can't afford a lawyer? You just pay off. <laughs> so there's a lot of levels of criminality throughout our, our all our societies and all kinds of levels. And, and the less money you have and the less legal options you have, the more you just uh, basically loan sharks come after you and they get you um, because you can't fight. You can't fight and um, you just take the loss and, and move on. Sucks. But, you know, I have found pretty good luck. With, so far, I found pretty, pretty good luck with the banks. Uh, so I have got my money back in those places. But, you know, it's it's always kind of a crapshoot. But then the question is, do you, you know, how, how do you how do you deal with anything? How do you function in life? Because you have to pay. Um, I've been robbed by mortgage companies. Um, that was that was terrible. I got completely robbed by a mortgage company. Um, they just said I didn't pay my mortgage when I did. And I had the evidence, but, and I sent it certified mail, but they kept claiming they never got the certified mail, even though they signed for it. <laughs> and I ended up losing like, I don't know, $2,500. I couldn't afford a lawyer to fight it. So, you know, I think, you know, it's interesting that they're, they're say there's a lot of criminal stuff that happens, a fraudulent stuff that happens in our lives that doesn't, isn't considered criminal. It's considered civil stuff. I wish it all would become criminal. I, I, I just, I don't understand how it's a civil issue. I don't think it's very civil. And I think that if you steal from me, I don't care if you're a company, you're a crook. And if you're a crook, I think you should go to prison. I don't understand this. So let's work it out in court, you know, in a civil court. But that's my personal little, little opinion. <laughs> okay. So, hmm, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it sucks. It really sucks. Uh, we're, we're all just kind of, <laughs> like darts are being thrown at us now. And I, and I do believe that as, 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 as things get more complicated, things go more electronic, things get more where you can't fight. You know, so you just honestly can't fight. So just always be aware of that. If you can't afford a lawyer, you can't fight. And if they know you can't afford a lawyer, you, you will lose. So my, my someone pointed out an interesting point to me. He said this, that um, the law is only as good as, if it can be enforced and that's true. So if you, if it can't be enforced, it's just not, it's not, it's, you can have it on the books, but it's, it's not really uh, uh, something that you can depend on. So it really sucks. Um, Benny says, Pat, thanks for your insights tonight. You shed a little more light on the mental state of Michaela Bali than most true crime shows have mentioned, which gives a more complete profile a picture. Well, you know, it's just sad. I mean, I just think in general, you know, I, I don't think she was kidnapped by a serial killer, at least not when she left. I mean, she left because she had mental issues, um, you know, or, or fam familial issues. So things weren't going well for her in her own mind. 
And, you know, if you look back to when you're 16, you know, there's a lot of distraught teenagers out there. I, was, I wasn't a happy teenager. I wasn't. I hated high school. Really hated high school. I wasn't. I wasn't a happy. I really wasn't a happy teenager. I did not do drugs. I did not drink. I wasn't in any kind of trouble. But I wasn't happy either. Um, and lucky for me, I didn't get into drugs and, and hang out with a really bad crowd. I just sulked a lot in my room. And then I, you know, as soon as I could get out of high school, I, you know, bought a ticket and went to West Africa. So at least <laughs> I wasn't going to New York City with no money. You know, I was going to West Africa and going on a, you know, on, on a college college trip. Um, so I, I I lucked out in certain ways uh, because I didn't, you know, say I wasn't into drugs and creepy dudes. Um, but uh, it's a lot of teenagers, you know, they get lost. I don't know where to go. I mean, and as the world gets more and more complicated, overwhelming, I think, you know, family has to be there to support the kids, to give them, you know, positive things to do, hope for the future. Oh, I just want, I'll say this. I've always felt this true. It's very, very true about gangbangers. You know, a gang gives you a family. A gang gives you something to do. A gang gives you a feeling of belonging even if it's only for a year or two, it gives you something. And the problem is a lot of gangbangers also don't see future. They don't, they don't think that there's anything out there for them. They believe that, well, you know, even if I were, I don't even know what to do to make my life better. So I'll probably just be some kind of loser and then I'll just be so messed up, you know, like they do down the block. Uh, you know, I don't want to end up like him. He's 50, but look at him. He's a, he ain't got nothing, you know? So, but if I can sell drugs, I can get the ladies. I can have a, a car. I may be dead by the time I'm 22, but I'd rather be dead by, I'd rather have a life till I'm 22 than be a loser at 44 because they don't see the future. And it's very hard when you don't see future. It's very depressing. So we, we see that happen when people who retire sometimes. People retire and then they die because they can't see a future. They don't have anything to do. You know, they lose, start losing their minds. Some people love retirement. They found tons of hobbies and all kinds of great things to do and they travel the world. Other people just go, I don't see any future. So we see that in all kinds of different categories of ages, of people suffering from that, um, feeling, feeling wanted, needed, and that they have hope. And once they lose that, they often just go off and take their chances, roll the dice and doesn't always end up well when you're talking about teenagers. So, but uh, oh, you're most uh, you're most welcome, Lisa. I'm glad you're here. You're always a pleasure. Um, wait a minute. Anne says you can't send gifts. You're a stalker. You can't help your son. You're an overbearing mother. <laughs> There's that line, I guess, Anne. You know, it is it is funny. Um, yeah, you know, it, it's tough. It's tough, especially being a parent, you know, and, and, you know, how much should you do? How much shouldn't you do? What What is appreciated? What is not appreciated? I think probably going in and hanging, ha hanging pictures all over your, your, your daughter, uh, your son's daughter, uh, girlfriend's, their house, rear, you know, changing their decorations. I mean, you know, I got my, I, I worked hard to decide what decorations I want in my house. I don't want somebody coming in here and deciding, oh, she likes kind of Indian style stuff. So let me come in here and uh, I'm going to put in uh, um, some uh, Kentucky roosters, you know, <laughs> on a Kentucky rooster pillows, you know, <laughs> it doesn't match, you know. Um, I don't want people to put pictures on my wall that I don't want on my wall. So, you know, there's uh, obviously, you know, I know you're joking, in, but that is true. I mean, it's, it's tough to know how to be a good friend, how to be, uh, reach out to people uh, and, and show them love and appreciation and also help people without crossing that line. I think, it, I think the point line comes when people become uncomfortable with the, with the line crossed um, and you take away their um, agency for decision-making. I think that's probably where it comes in, but who knows? <laughs> so anyway, good night, everybody. Um, yeah. Good night, everybody, and I'm, I'll come, come on Sunday, and uh, I'm going to do that the uh, the the show on the missing 50 year old lady who ends up dead in the mountains. I mean, it is Judy Judy Smith, right? Gosh, I wish I remember what the heck I was doing, right? 
<laughs> Smith, right? Judith Smith. I got the right name now. Oh my God. See, I can't remember names. I mean, I got so many names. I can't, I can't keep up on them. So I just want to make sure I'm saying that right. Okay. Somebody tell me before. See, I, I depend on you guys to, to keep me in line here. Um, I think it's Judy Smith, right? Judy Smith. Okay. Bizarre murder of Judy Smith. That's what it's called, but it is really, it is really fascinating. And I think that uh, it, uh, there's a lot to, to learn from um, uh, studying that particular case. And uh, so I, I, you know, I've thought in the run again, I always get these cases people ask me to do and I go, I don't know if I have anything to say about that, but now I got, I've been, I, I, I didn't sleep well last night because I spent the whole night going through the case in my head. And so I kept waking up and I'm just, you know, now I need to go to bed <laughs> so I can get some sleep and not think about this case. Uh, but it's going to be a really interesting one. So that's going to be Sunday, this Sunday at 3 p.m. And uh, again, everybody like the video, subscribe to the channel, join Patreon and support the channel. Even if you can't make all eight shows, you know, appreciate the support anyway. Um, and uh, check the playlist for all the things you're actually interested in. And uh, they'll be there. Uh, maybe. <laughs> I'm, eventually, I'll, I'll probably do every case that ever existed. So, you know, uh, there's so many of them. It's amazing how sad, sadly to say that in our world, we have a whole lot of murder. So anyway, hopefully see you on Sunday. Bye. <laughs>